Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, and we are God's Church of Love Online, and I'm getting ready to read Proverbs 6. For those of you who think all you need to do is cross your arms and believe God, I got a little something for you. Check this out. Don't sit around waiting for stuff to drop out of the sky. God wants you to activate the faith you have in him. The Bible says, Faith without works is dead. Now I want you to hear this scripture. Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms, folding of the hands to sleep. So shalt thy poverty come as one that, tra that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Now listen. If you're wondering where this is going, you see the writing on the wall. We're in the last days. We know that. You see the writing on the wall. It's starting to look very apocalyptic in this day and age. My question to you is, are you heeding the warning signs? Are you taking advice and beginning to store up? And this is what I want you to hear. What Joseph did, and I know you know the story about Joseph being sold into slavery from the jealousy of his brothers, and how later on, after a bunch of craziness went on, and I think he did 16 or 18 years, some ridiculous amount of time, but while he was in there, God had given him the gift of interpretation of dreams, and dreams themselves. And this is what got him in position to be a blessing to a lot of people. But I want you to hear the wisdom he used. Genesis 41. See, a lot of you think all you have to do is just believe God, quote his word, say a few good juicy prayers, shed a few tears, get up off your knees and go take a nap. This is what I want you to hear. We're in very precarious times, God's people. And I want you to think about how God requires activity. There are things that God requires of us to do, not just pray, not just believe for. He requires us to do. And I don't want to see any of God's people left hanging high and dry when there's nothing, there are no resources. If you do your part, when it's time for God to do his miracles, you'll get to see those quickly. But if you're doing nothing, you cannot expect for God to do it all for you. He is not a welfare God. Okay, listen. Um, now, the guy had a dream uh, Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph interpreted the dream. So God promotes him. Let's jump right to the chase. Mm. And this is what said, starting at verse 40. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. That's Pharaoh promoting Joseph. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him rule over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without thee, shall no man lift up his hand or foot 
in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephnethpaniah, whatever. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. And he gave him to wife Asena, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now, check this out. This is what Joseph did. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Remember he had the dream? Pharaoh had the dream and Joseph interpreted. And he said the first seven years were years of plenty. The second seven years was a famine, a very hard famine. Well, listen, this is what he did about it. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, lady up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until <clears throat> he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph was born two sons, and it goes on about his family. Now, later on, it says in verse 53, and the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt was ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the land. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. In other words, there was food, there was supply, there was provision. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. What did Pharaoh say? Hmm. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph. What he saith to do, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the store houses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now, why was Joseph able to be such a tremendous blessing? He prepared. He saw the writing on the wall and he acted accordingly. My question to you is what are you doing? This is more of a practical word. See, we think that walking with the Lord is a welfare experience. We hold our hand out and we, we say, my name is Jimmy and I want you to give me. No, God says, I require things of you. You have to use the wisdom that I planted in those noodles between your two ears. You ought to use wisdom. You see what's coming. You see what's going on. You already see what's happening in China. You can imagine how bad it can get here. What are you doing to prepare for it? Are you turning a deaf ear and a blind eye? saying, the Lord shall provide, the Lord shall provide. Oh, great is my God, he'll provide. They're just putting out a bunch of wolf tickets. They're selling wolf tickets. It ain't that bad, baby cakes. Whatever you are hearing from the media, it is way worse because they do not want the shelves to be empty. They want the money to come in at a steady pace. So no, they're not trying to sell wolf tickets. They're trying to downplay this whole thing. So if you think it sounds bad, multiply it by four to 10 times. Then you have a closer, more accurate picture as to what we're sliding into right now. The beginning of sorrows looks like it has come. Don't ignore, don't turn a blind eye because it bothers you to think about it. 
Don't turn a blind eye because you lived in the land of plenty for so long that you can't face the possibility of going through a, a famine with, with pestilence and sickness, death, oh Lord. No, 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 you can't picture that. You don't want to think about martial law. You want to go into denial. God did not call his people to go into denial. He called us to faith, and faith without works is dead. So you must apply works with your faith. It's not going to be a long message. It's going to be a practical one. If part of your house catches on fire, you don't get on your knees and say, Lord, put the fire out. You get your behind up off your chair and you grab the fire extinguisher, the water hose, the blanket, whatever you must use to douse the fire out while the other hand dials 911 for the fire department to get there and do what you cannot do. See, we are so spoiled in this country. We have this, this world of make-believe. God is a very practical God. If Joseph had not done what he did, imagine how many more people would have died during the famine. Imagine, he was the one that did what he did. God positioned him for that. Now, when you know God has positioned you and equipped you to handle certain types of crisis in your life and in other people's lives, don't sit on your do nothing and do nothing. It's not about faith. The devils believe they tremble, but faith without works is dead. You must act on your faith. You don't exemplify your faith by what you believe. You exemplify your faith by what you do about it. I know you guys know I was blessed with a car. If I had never cleared out my garage, if I had never sold the old car, would God have even brought the other car into reach? Faith without works is dead. When you are waiting for a blessing, make room for your blessing. You don't just pray for it, fold your arms and see what God's going to do. Because God can fold his arms and look at you and say, I ain't doing nothing till you do something. What did Jesus tell the, uh, 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 what's his face? I can't think of his name, uh, Nathan or whatever. Uh, he told him when, uh, not Nathan, I can't think of his name. But anyway, it was, uh, it was one of the guys that had gotten leprosy. And he sent and called for uh, the prophet to come and lay hands on him for him to get a miracle. And the prophet sent his servant to the guy because the guy had, had ego, pride issues. He was an arrogant man. So Isaiah, or whoever the prophet was, sends his servant to the man. He says, you want to be healed? This is what you must do. He didn't say this is what God's going to do. He said, this is what you must do. And he told the man to go to the river and dip his body, totally immersing it seven times. The man was not happy. Number one, he was indignant. Oh, yes, he was. His pride was, I mean, see, it ain't about attitude. It's about what you do with what you believe. The man's attitude was foul. He wasn't happy. He was not a happy camper. Why? Because he was a man of stature. How dare this man send his servant to me? Why didn't he come and talk to me himself? I sent for the prophet, not for the prophet's servant. How dare he? That was number one. He was ticked off about that. Number two. Where he told him to dip was not a place of stature. It was not in a nice area 
on the be on the right side of the tracks. It was not in the affluent neighborhood. No, he told him to go dip in the dirty river. And he was very ticked about that. Very ticked. He was not happy. But it was either your pride, your name, your image, or your healing, which is most important to you. And what did he do? Took his unhappy hips and dragged his tail behind him as he got into that nasty river and dipped seven times like he was told to do by a servant. Hmm. Came up that seventh time, baby. His skin was as clean as a baby's bottom. No leprosy nowhere. It was on him the sixth time. He still had leprosy after the sixth dip. So it was dip number one, come up, still got leprosy. Dip number two, come up, still has leprosy. Dip number three, dip number four, dip number five, still got leprosy. What's up? Dip number six, leprosy. But it took the seventh dip, baby. Came up out of that seventh dip, clean as a whistle, healed. Totally healed as if he never had leprosy. We have to be willing to do what it takes to activate the miracles of God. Yes, he will work miracles for his people. But he will require things at your hand. Are you willing to do what he tells you to do? Now, for those of you Hmm. who don't know where you stand with the Lord. Let me quote 2 Chronicles 7, 14 to you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Did you hear that? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from, turn from, not turn to, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and will heal their land. China needs healing, doesn't it? How many other countries need healing? We need healing right here in America. Some of you need healing. Are you willing to humble yourself? See, that's the do part of the faith, not just believing in Jesus Christ. Are you willing to do what it takes to receive the healing? Are you ready to forsake your wicked ways? Are you ready to cut loose the partners that you've been sinning with? Are you ready to leave your life behind and start new and give God all the glory, give God all the control, Give God all the authority. Let him rest, rule, and abide in your life so that you, too, can be healed or at least receive mercy. Or is it only, my name is Jimmy, and I want you to give me, give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy, and I want you to give me, give me, give me. Come on, God is good. Come on, God. Come on, have mercy, have mercy. And as soon as he gives you a little douse of mercy, you back to let's get it on. Ah, oh, sugar, let's get it on. Let's love, baby. And you just off to the races, right back to your sin. You got your healing. Uh, you ain't got time for him now. Yeah, he's not a sugar daddy. He's not a patsy. He's not your bellhop. Hello. He's not Santa Claus. There are requests. Requirements. You got to bring some to get some, baby. It's street, but it's true. You got to bring some to get some. What are you willing to bring to the negotiation table? Hmm. Some of you are sitting up here waiting for God to work all kind of miracles. You know that a lot of these sicknesses are birthed from sin itself. 
But you want to blame God for the sickness. You want to blame God for the deaths. Yeah, nobody wants to be bothered with God till they need him. But what are you willing to do once he comes through for you? Mm-hmm. Mm. Call on the Lord while he is near. Please, whatever you do, the time to seek God is now. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. You see all the videos in China, folks laying on the ground, dead. Didn't know they were going to die that second, dead. Walking down the street, dropping dead. You have no idea when your time will come. Are you ready? You're either going to be resurrected to a new life in heaven, or you're going to be resurrected right here on earth and healed. But the bottom line is, are you doing your part at the negotiation table? Or you want God to do it all for you while you do the sluggard thing and lay back and chill? What you doing? I'm chilling. What you doing? I'm chilling. Waiting on the Lord, girl. Waiting on the Lord. Oh, yes. Yeah, he going to come through for me because he's a good God. He's a mighty God. He's a powerful God. Yes, he is, but he ain't no fool. What are you doing? How are you participating in the bargain? Okay. Turn to the Lord. Cry out to him. Yes, you're doing the right thing. He's the only one that can fix this mess. But are you willing from this day forward to give it all to him? Are you willing to forsake your way and walk in his? Hmm. Good question. I leave you with that question and that challenge. I sure hope you have the right answer. God bless you.